Poker is like a bike. Two cards, two wheels. All about knowing when to pump the brakes. Alex, for the love of God, you already gambled your car away playing poker. I just love poker based off of just the gameplay. You need to talk to someone about this. Which is why I want to talk about this. Bellatro is a surprisingly complex poker roguelike game. You remember New Soup on the DS? Yeah, that game really gave me some potent um nightmares. But well, not because of that. Because of him. This dude robbed me of all of my hard earnings day after day. And we'd come to find out he was scamming us the whole time. But the whole point is, Bellatro is like Luigi's poker, but not it. Wait, it is Italian? In ancient Rome, a Bellatro was a professional jester or buffoon, sort of like what you do with your videos. That is deeply hurtful. So how do you play? Well, it's basically poker. The better the hand, the more points you score. But at some point, this isn't gonna cut it. Use more hands, discard all you want. Discard isn't good enough. So what do you do? Well, this game took some notes from Super Smash Bros. Ultimate and added Joker. Jokers give you different abilities that affect how you play your hands. Some give you chips, some are multipliers, some do some, uh, don't look at me like that. Besides all this, you got these uh, JoJo tarot cards that give stand abilities to your deck. And astrology, so you can learn how to talk to women. One, two, three, that's Bellatro. And I mean, if you have a poker addiction, it's a good way to wean it off. But I was sort of wondering, how is it such an addicting game? I mean, it's just cards. I could do this at home. Well, I believe Bellatro knocks it out of the park with its style. You take a look at the title screen and you enter a Fruit Gushers dimension, all accented with the synthy sounds of this song. And that's what I want to talk about. Because when you launch this game to the five hours you spend losing, this song never stops. And it's as if as the song never stops, you too never stop playing. But I think it goes deeper than that. Because the choices made in this song symbolize the gameplay almost too perfectly. So Lois Clement, he made some great choices here. Starting with, um, do you know the, the, the time signature of this thing? 4-4? Four, 3-4? Four, four, uh, no. 7-4. Check the pre-flop range. This is a fold. Do you know how to count 7-4? This is what it would sound like. Just to get it to sound decent, you gotta put 4-4 four, four, and 3-4 together, 2-4 and 6-8. And somehow that symbolizes just sort of the essence of this game where you're trying to put together two random jokers and make them work. Due to the abnormality of the time signature, I think choosing a hi-hat to perpetually carry you through the song helps you stay focused within the game. Couple that with the bass line that has a few gaps that leaves you guessing where the song is gonna go, and you have something that is introspective. Something without a clear destination, and that's only accented by the opening note. Listen to this guy, it has anxiety. So, okay, this key of the song is in G major because the game's a major G. And this isn't actually too different from the key of C, which is all the white keys. Ah! However, the last one, the seven, shifts up to an F sharp, which is the opening note here. This is the perfect choice because this note in the key, it could go in any direction after this. Just like how when you start a run, you have no idea what you're gonna be working. I, why are you giving me nothing? What do you want me to do with this? This is the seven, which is the note of just like, I can't decide on a Netflix movie. It's like, um, I don't know what I want to watch. Um, I'm feeling sad, but maybe we could watch something happy, but I don't know. And then, you know, it's just, it's like indecision. It's like, uh, which direction are we taking this? But that's not it, because this note, it also utilizes an oscillator. It's what a note in a song does this. Except this one, it doesn't just change pitches, it slowly doubles back on itself and gets faster and faster. Like a car constantly braking in traffic. And to me, this just perfectly symbolizes you have your chips multiplied by your malt, multiplied by your multiplier. And you see that score go up 100,000, 1 million, 10 million, until you hit the E numbers. Which 
is the next note in the song. And this sort of tense rise and fall, it's in all parts of the song, like this rising mallet arpeggio. I just visualize the chips slowly being counted up as the score climbs and climbs with this nice, simple tone repeating. But like I said, this song plays from when you launch the game to when you close it. And you'd think that kinda get a little repetitive and boring. So to spice it up a little bit, the song has now, adaptive music, this can be sort of misconstrued sometimes, but there's actually two main forms of it. Vertical and horizontal reorchestration. And the way we can visualize this is... Wait, I work here! So, um, the best example I can think of is... Look at this cheeky motherfucker, what even is any of this? After you eventually survive all of this dog shit, you will shift into trying to ask for help from one of these souls. And each section actually has a different song playing. Each song loops, but you know, everyone's gonna take a different amount of time to complete each of these sections. So it's similar to how if you're on the timeline, you change the length of the clips, but all the same, they're in order, one after another. Vertical reorchestration, however, is if you add layers on top of each other. It can be instruments or different versions of a song. You've seen this in Plants vs. Zombies where you think you're kicking ass, you have no problems in, uh, what? What's that flag? And the song turns into a bombastic symphony symbolizing all of the chaotic zombies coming your way and the new Paper Mario remake. Someone just pickpocketed you. I don't even know what that guy's doing. I, I, I need a mental health break. I need to find a safe space, this is too much. And... They, re they really did it. They really did it. So yeah, vertical, you fade stuff on top to give uh, any desired effect you want. But what are we talking about, like John Bellatro? Bellatro. The song has different variations depending on the context of the game, so. Why don't we start a run to see what I mean? All right, you're talking to the master here. This is easy for me, you know? I know numbers, I can count. That's a four, so we complete this, but when we get to the shop... You notice it becomes a little bit more... clear? That backing synth pad, it's completely gone. And the drums, they're a lot more prevalent now. Making it sort of like... A breath of relief, you have space to think and plan your attack now. And it's subtle, and you're not gonna notice it, but you feel it when you're in the shop for a while. And this is sort of the main area where all of the themes will change, because when we open an Arcana pack... <laughs> We're in Luigi's Mansion! That's a Luigi! I remember Luigi! He's right fucking there! That's Luigi! I love Luigi. Sucking up ghosts, we're putting purple flirp on our cards, changing twos to aces, and making everything a heart. You know, for the most cursed part of this game, changing your deck like this, it actually works to have a theme like this. It's swirly and chaotic, and when it fades from the other theme, oh, it just sounds so good. But maybe my favorite are the celestial packs. We're surrounded by the vacuum of space. Symbolized by this synth pad now taking dominance and everything else being faded behind it. It's scary how we're drifting through without a path in mind, yet can find moments of peace where we... I, I can't even use any of these! So we've got our jokers, we enhanced our deck, we now know astrology so we can make conversation at parties. But now it's time to face the boss. We enter this wormhole and the lead synth is gone. We only have one repetitive tone to hold on to, and the synth pad, it dominates the entire song. It's overwhelming. It's intruding. Try as we might to organize our cards in any feasible order, we all meet the same end at some point. It's brilliant. Like a stack of cards falling. It this is the only time the song loses any sense of consistency. It's an amazing effect that pulls you right out of the action as you lose. It's a full circle moment. New soup. You send this guy to the great abyss. And now it's time to lock lips with the princess. 
I was about to plant one on this thing. This sound is just the epitome of disappointment. It plays in my head daily. <laughs> and when you do eventually say one more run, you select that button. Ooh! <laughs> I, I, I like this game. I really like this game. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god! So go play Bellatro. What are you doing? Come on. Do something. You'd be a fool not to try this game. Here's the thing. AAA games are never doing this. But with an indie game, with a small scope, you can one, create a gameplay style that is not attuned to the larger market, and two, do stuff with the presentation that AAA games can only dream of. This level of artistry is only in indie games. It's suited to the gameplay, and why I think you need to try Bellatro. I cannot be held responsible for your addiction. Which brings me back to my debts. If you could spare a cent, maybe 500, that would be helpful. Yeah, we just need to sell off some of your assets. My assets? But mouse pads. You didn't think that was mine, did you? Come on, I am way nicer than that. <laughs> Hey everybody, thanks for watching all the way to the end. I, you know what, I love this video, so you don't even need to like it. I liked it enough for the both of us. That's gonna be it for me, I don't have much to say this time around. I took a little bit of a break, but you know, I broke the break, and now I'm breaking bread with you. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you on the flip side.